Aloha, welcome to General Pharmacology. Let's move the PowerPoint slides and get started today. Uh, this is the very first lecture of the Farm 203 series. Uh, I like to talk a little bit about um, the uh, prerequisites uh, for this course. So we'll spend a little bit of time talking about biochemistry, basic biochemistry. We'll spend a little time talking about cellular physiology, and then we'll actually start talking about pharmacology. Um, I used to, when I was a kid, I used to watch something called Connections by David Attenborough. I don't think I was that much of a kid. And he would connect something uh, to something else across time. And I was convinced that that man could con uh, connect anything uh, to any story from the very beginning of time. And so uh, in that spirit, uh, I thought we would go as far back uh, in time as possible and start uh, the pharmacology course there. Uh, and so long before time, uh, there were stories. Oh, by the way, uh, if you need anything, email me, sfarmer at hawaii.edu. Uh, everything you need to know for this course is in laulima, laulima.hawaii.edu. Uh, someday I'll make a video about how to uh, uh, go through the syllabus and all that, but it's really simple. Uh, watch the lectures, take the quizzes. That's all you need to know. Uh, me, I have the greatest job on earth sitting in this chair and broadcasting across the planet and I'm sure there's uh, more information about me as we go along. Well, enough about that. Uh, let's start pharmacology uh, even back uh, before the beginning of time. Uh, with this story right here, the demigod Maui and his goddess mother Hina lived near Rainbow Falls in Hilo on the island of Hawaii. And Hina would make kapa from the bark of the waka and mamaki tree and the strips would be dyed with magnificent designs to form cloth. The kapa, however, would still be damp when night fell, and Hina would lament how the sun moved too quickly across the sky to dry the cloth. And upon hearing this, the demigod traveled to the island of Maui and climbed to the 10,000-foot summit of Haleakala, where the sun was asleep in the giant crater. Maui hid until morning and watched the sun begin his daily journey, and as the first ray of sunshine appeared, Maui snared the sun with his lasso of twisted coconut fiber. The sun demanded to be released, but Maui would not let go. Promise me you will move more slowly across the sky, he told the sun, and left with no choice, the sun struck a bargain with the daring demigod. The sun would move slowly for six months out of the year and then move at his own preferred pace for the other six months. And agreeing to the compromise, Maui hurried home and told his mother the good news. And as a reward, Hina made her son a new cape, and sure enough, it dried in one afternoon. Uh, so why does our story begin there? Well, our story in pharmacology begins, of course, in Maui and with the sun. And if you look into our day sky, uh, you will see our very blessed sun. It is very special, uh, especially to those of us in Hawaii. If you look in the night sky, you see many, 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 many other suns, and they're all very special too. And they are brothers and sisters, the stars. And the sun and the stars have life cycles just like any living, any living creature. The stars are born, they live strong, they grow old, and they die, just like we do. But when the first ancient stars were born, there was no life in this universe. There were no planets. And the ancient stars were alone, and they grew old alone and died. But when the ancient stars died, they left behind a very special dust. And in this, new, in this dust, new stars were born. But not only were new suns and stars born into this dust, but now planets were born for the very first time in the dust of the ancient stars. For all the ingredients of life were left behind by the ancient stars who were born into nothing. And it is in the dust of the ancient fires we are born into paradise. And if you look at the ancient stories across cultures, these same stories come up over and over again because they come from the beginning of time itself. Well, the ancient stardust and all its ingredients of life have been studied carefully by many who are fascinated and in love with nature and creation. 
So if you sat in the back of a science class, there was some table up there that many of us uh, were afraid to look at, and uh, it's taken a long time to figure out what that table actually means. So we're going to cover it a little bit, talk about the important stuff, uh, and not worry about the rest. And that's this table right here. When we see this table, I want you to see the dust of the ancient stars that gave us the building blocks of life. Yeah, some of the stuff at the bottom uh, only occurs in a lab. Uh, for uh, a billion trillionth of a second. Uh, the rest of the stuff is stuff that the stars gave us. Well, how do we know any of this? I think it's really interesting when I'm in church and the guy who uses his cell phone and uh, all sorts of modern technology to improve his life uh, sits there and tells us that scientists have no idea what they're talking about. And so the point of this story is the very technology uh, that drives this broadcast to your eyes, the same technology uh, that you, we use to make our cell phones work, the same technology uh, that we use to understand the universe around us. And so it's rainbows that tell us the secrets about the sun and the stars. And we in Hawaii are very familiar with rainbows. We are the uh, University of Hawaii Rainbow Warriors, because the rainbows tell us so many secrets about nature and creation. All right, rainbows are billions of little water droplets that refract light like a prism. And so right here is a little crystal, a triangular crystal. And what this picture is trying to show you is the light is coming in here, right? The white light is being beamed into uh, this little prism, this crystal and some refractive light, white light comes off. Uh, we can ignore that, but what I want you to see is this crystal, this prism is turning the white light into its various colors. Um, and so that's what a prism does. It refracts light and turns white light and separates it into all its various colors because when you see white light, you're seeing all sorts of colored light mixed together. So the different colors of light have different wavelengths. I think we have that here. Notice uh, the blue wavelengths are tighter together uh, than the longer wavelengths. And those of you who surf or hang around the ocean, you know the waves come in uh, over different timings. And when the waves are far apart, those are long wavelengths. And the waves are close together. Those are short wavelengths. And when we take electromagnetic waves, uh, the longer ones will be in the red direction. Uh, and the shorter ones will be in the blue direction. And this is all very fascinating uh, to study in depth. So if you ever have an opportunity to take a physics class where they talk about this stuff, uh, it certainly uh, opened my eyes to the concept of color. All right, so again, prisms divide light into its various wavelengths. So again, uh, here is the white light coming in. And because of bouncing inside of the prism, uh, how the red light bounces, it's going to come out a little bit different place. It's going to bounce differently uh, than how the blue light uh, comes out. And so that's how, white, uh, uh, how a prism is able to take white light and divide it into a rainbow. Well, let's take something else. Uh, usually in science we make these great discoveries by taking a couple of things and mixing them together. And so that's what today's lecture will cover. Uh, so let's talk about flame calorimetry. All right, so anything that we burn will give off a flame that gives light. And a long time ago, uh, all sorts of people studied that very carefully. And we noticed that if we uh, burn something and it gives off a light and we place it through that prism, when it divides up its rainbow, it'll uh, make a very unique spectrum of light that we can measure. Well, the sun and the stars burn with specific colors of light, too, and this tells us the chemistry inside of them. This was a landmark achievement in astronomy when we realize that the chemistry going on on our side of our sun is identical to the chemistry going on in stars clear across the universe. And this is the reason why, because when we take that light and we put it through a prism, certain chemical reactions will absorb that frequency of light. And so we can see these little black lines on our rainbow. They're like grooves of a record, uh, an old vinyl record. And everywhere 
that we see a line is a place where a chemical reaction is occurring that's absorbing that wavelength of light. And when we look at the sun through a very careful set of glasses, uh, we can see this pattern and we can point the telescope out across the universe and see the same pattern as well. And so that was a landmark discovery in science when we combined uh, flame calorimetry with uh, dividing the spectrum of light and comparing that uh, to objects close and objects across the universe. Well, with very special glasses, we can see the entire spectrum of electromagnetic waves. And so what they're trying to show you here is the entire uh, spectrum of electromagnetic waves. And what we can see with our eyes is only a tiny sliver. Uh, generally, what we see with our eyes is uh, the spectrum of light that is most common to come from a medium-sized star like our own. Uh, but electromagnetic waves include gamma waves, uh, which have very long wavelengths, x-rays, which have uh, very long, I'm sorry, it's the other way around, yeah, increasing wavelengths. Oh, we're getting, okay, long radio waves have the longest wavelengths, and gamma rays have the shortest wavelengths. So when we talk about gamma rays and x-rays and ultraviolet, we're talking about electromagnetic waves uh, that are part of the frequency that we cannot see. Uh, when we talk about infrared, microwave, AM and FM radio waves, and long radio waves, we're talking about electromagnetic waves that we cannot see with our eyes. Uh, however, we can detect them. A great way to see electromagnetic waves that you can't see is with uh, your cell phone. If you take your cell phone and take a picture, if you get your camera on your cell phone, look at the front of a remote control. The little light bulb on a remote control, you push on it and you don't see any light. Your, your camera can see it and you'll see that light bulb come on and off uh, with, your, with your cell phone camera even though you can't see it with your own eyes. And so we have all sorts of instruments. You guys have an instrument in your car that can see uh, AM and FM radio waves. Uh, you know how a microwave works. And so these are all spectrum of electromagnetic waves, and we use all of this information to determine uh, the chemistry and physics of stuff going on across the universe. Right now, X-rays are one of the most exciting things going on uh, as we point our telescopes towards the skies. All right, well, when the first cell phones were being developed, there was a problem. Uh, scientists had, were detecting this background, background frequency of microwaves. And they did not know this, but these microwaves were coming from all directions of outer space. So these guys trying to make the cell phones work, they hear this buzzing noise in their antenna, and they think, oh, it must be pigeon poop. We'll clean it out real nice. So they went and cleaned it out real nice. They got the same buzzing noise, and they thought, you know, maybe we really didn't do a good enough job building the receiver. So they took the receiver out. They completely rebuilt the electronics. They shoved it back in the machine, and they keep hearing the same thing. And they think, hmm, what is this problem? Well, clear across the globe, at the same time, uh, there were um, um, physicists and astronomers thinking, you know, there should be a frequency of background microwave radiation coming from all directions of outer space, uh, but we're not sure the frequency or how to pick that up. And one day, the cell phone developers got in contact uh, with these astronomers and made an incredible discovery uh, in physics. Uh, not only for all of those of you who are interested in cell phones, uh, but for those of us uh, who are interested in, in physics and astronomy as well. All right, well, to understand what any of this means, we have to understand the Doppler effect. All right, well, the Doppler effect is something that you would understand if you get on YouTube and watch race cars, if you've ever seen uh, on TV race cars going by, uh, when the race car goes by the camera, what does it do? It goes, meow, meow. When something goes past, it has a high pitch as it's coming towards you, and as it goes away, meow. Uh, and so when something is headed a certain direction and making waves, uh, the wavelengths in front of it are going to be shorter 
than the wavelengths behind it. Now sound is not an electromagnetic wave. Sound is a physical wave uh, generated by air molecules bouncing against each other. But whether they are electromagnetic waves or water waves, physical waves, sound waves, they all behave with the Doppler effect. If something is moving through space and making waves, the wavelengths in front will be shorter than the wavelengths in back. And so that's why when something's coming towards you, like a train or a race car or anything, generating sound as it moves, when it moves towards you, you'll notice the pitch is higher. And as it moves away, the pitch is lower. That's the Doppler effect. And we're aware of that in our, we, we see that in our day uh, to day uh, activities if you pay close attention. The Doppler effect is very important in this course because right now it's coming towards us and before you know it, it'll be over. And that's why we talk about the Doppler effect. All right, let's talk about the hydrogen shift. Again, we know from flame calorimetry that stars will take hydrogen and make helium. And this gives off this very specific frequency of light, not only from our sun, uh, but the suns across the universe. Well, as stars move away from us, that light is going to be shifted by the Doppler effect. And so we'll call this the red shift. We'll call this the hydrogen shift. Um, and so uh, here is the signature of uh, our sun. If we take the sun's light, put it through the rainbow, or put it through the prism and make this nice rainbow. Uh, we'll see these nice grooves that reflect the chemistry inside of our sun, the physics and chemistry inside of our sun. Well, if you take the telescopes and point them across the universe, you'll notice exactly the same signature, but shifted in the red direction. And because it's shifted in the red direction, that tells us that it's moving away from us. And something we realized is everything is moving away from us very quickly. We're hard pressed to find anything uh, that's actually moving towards us. There's a few things, uh, but everything else is expanding quickly. Well, this background radiation that bothered the very first cell phone developers was caused by very bright light uh, from a very big bang, maybe 300,000 years later. Uh, but this bright light has changed to microwaves because the universe is expanding and the Doppler effect is stretching those waves. And so the evidence of this very bright light from a very big bang is everywhere we see if we have the right kind of eyes to see the microwave radiation. The mountain whispers the wonders of creation, and that's why everyone thinks the mountaintop is sacred. Everyone knows the mountaintop is sacred, and because it does whisper uh, the wonders of creation. And that was first told to me uh, by this gentleman right here, God rest his soul. If you listen to the mountain, it will whisper to you. And so the mountain does whisper uh, things, uh, not only spiritually, uh, but things about chemistry and physics and the world around us so that we can have a better understanding about how to use energy in this world in an efficient and sustainable, sustainable uh, matter. Uh, that's what those telescopes will bring to us eventually. All right, back to our regularly scheduled program. The dust of the ancient stars uh, gave us the building blocks of life. It's an enormous amount of information to wrap your head around, but I want you to keep in mind as we go through this course that there are people who spent their entire lives dedicating themselves to only one teeny, 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 tiny piece of the puzzle. There are people who gave their entire life uh, and uh, sacrificed their life uh, finding one of these squares. And so there are all sorts of people who have gone into this scientific knowledge and made a piece of the puzzle for us. And so the point I'm trying to make is that all of these uh, scientific discoveries are all connected. When we take courses, we think, oh, well, physics is one thing, and biology is this over here, and, and chemistry is that over there. Like, they're all separate things. And something I want you to understand in this course is that all the sciences are connected with each other. 
Uh, all of the basic sciences have some kind of not only connection with each other, uh, but every basic science has a connection in pharmacology. All right, so when we look at the periodic table, there's lots and lots of squares uh, that millions of people have sacrificed their lives so that we can understand them. And we're going to talk about a very few important ones, and we're not going to worry about the rest today. <coughs> And so today's lecture is about the basic building blocks of biochemistry. There they are on our periodic table. Uh, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And so these are our basic building blocks of biochemistry. Hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. In, in case you see that on a quiz question. Let's talk a little bit about atoms. Let's talk about a gold coin, and let's say it's made of pure gold. Now gold is an element on the periodic table. We don't use it much in biologic systems. We don't use it at all in biologic systems. Uh, however, gold is an element on the periodic table. And to make the point, we can split the gold coin in half, and we can divide it again and again and again and again and again. And we can divide that coin until we have trillions of teeny, 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 tiny gold specks. Right? Well, eventually, we're going to have a little gold speck that we can't divide anymore. And what we have is a, a gold atom. And if we try to divide that gold atom, uh, we're, no longer, we're no longer going to have an atom that's gold. I, I think on the mushroom, I, I think on the YouTube channel there's a mushroom cloud. If we split atoms, uh, not only will we not have the same atom, uh, but we'll have this enormous release of force. And so once we divide atoms, uh, things change significantly. So in chemistry and physics, an atom is the smallest particle that still characterizes that chemical element. Again, the gold speck, uh, that's a gold atom, is still gold. If you divide that, uh, you're going to end up with a giant mess of something else. All right, atoms are very, 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 very small. And so next time you're at the beach, uh, take a handful of sand and look at one little teeny, teeny, tiny grain of sand and realize that that grain of sand on that beach is the same scale as an atom inside of the grain of sand. That's how small atoms are. They're so small we can't really take pictures of them. There's things on the internet. Oh, we took a picture of an atom. I think Heisenberg would have a problem with all that. Uh, but again, atoms are very small. An atom in a grain of sand is like a grain of sand on Big Beach. When we talk about atoms, we'll talk about a center or nucleus of protons, and it gives that the proton has a positive charge. And so later on, we're going to talk about drugs that are charged. They're either going to be positively charged or negatively charged. And things that are positively charged has to do with uh, one extra proton uh, in the center or the nucleus. Well, around the nucleus uh, are orbiting electrons, and they each have a negative charge for each electron. So each proton has a positive charge, each electron has a negative charge, and atoms are generally defined by an equal number of protons and electrons uh, swirling around the nucleus. However, the type of element is quite simply defined by the number of protons. And so if it has one proton in the nucleus, it's a hydrogen. If it has two protons in the nucleus, it's a helium. If it has three, it's a lithium, and so forth. And so that's what these numbers in the upper left-hand corner of the box denote on your periodic table. How many protons are in the nucleus to define that element? So we'll start with hydrogen, the smallest atom. Hydrogen is the number one, so that means it has one proton in the nucleus. And a hydrogen atom then would have the same number of electrons in orbit around it, because the positive charge is attracted to the negative charge. Uh, but the negative charge is spinning so fast it can't possibly fall into the proton. If you take a string with a weight and you spin it around in a circle real fast, well, the string is pulling them together, but they're not going to collide because they're busy spinning. And this is what happens here. If the electron quits spinning, uh, they squish into each other. Uh, but here we have one proton and one electron. Right next to hydrogen on the periodic table is helium. Uh, helium has two protons and two electrons. Helium, that number two up in the upper left, 
uh, denotes two protons and two electrons. Helium is a perfect atom. We call that inert. We're not going to talk much about neutrons in here. Later on, if you ever talk about isotopes, isotopes are just quite simply uh, atoms that have varying numbers of neutrons. And so here's a hydrogen atom. It's defined as one proton with its one electron. But here it has a neutron in the nucleus. And it doesn't do anything but just make the hydrogen heavier. It's not any different. It's just heavier. Uh, maybe you've heard of tritium. Uh, tritium is very heavy. Hydrogen with an extra uh, neutron uh, there. So we have two neutrons and a proton. This is still hydrogen. We'll call it heavy hydrogen. They're just different isotopes of hydrogen. So there's one proton, it's a hydrogen, it's got two neutrons, so that's uh, heavy. I think they call that tritium. Uh, I could be wrong. Uh, here is uh, the proton hydrogen with one neutron. So these are just two different isotopes of hydrogen. We're not going to talk much about this, but we do talk about isotopes when we talk about nuclear medicine, and this is where that information comes from. Because in your healthcare career, people are going to talk to you and treat you uh, like you have some kind of PhD in science and I'm here to tell you uh, I know better. So we're not going to talk about neutrons unless we talk about isotopes. All right, so not only are atoms really, really, really small, the parts that make up the atoms are really, really small uh, as well. And so think about this. Here's my hydrogen atom and let's blow it up to the size of a football field. Well, if my hydrogen atom was the size of a football field, the proton would be the size of a golf ball or a guava fruit and the electron would be the size of a peanut in the orbit around the football field. And so when I'm talking about a hydrogen atom that takes up space, it's this, elect it's this orbiting electron that defines the space and notice the actual parts taking up the space, uh, they don't take up any space at all. And so that's why we can take something uh, the size of a stadium and compress it down into the size of a guava fruit if the electrons quit orbiting. Uh, actually, we can compress uh, a star down to the size of nothing uh, by making the electrons quit spinning. And that's what black hole, that's, that's where black holes come from. But that's all interesting stuff. Uh, that you can read about when you're not so busy filling out pharmacology quizzes. Electrons are super fast. Nothing travels faster. They go so fast we can't figure out where they are uh, at any one time. Uh, and so that's why we think they're everywhere uh, at the same time and they fill, fill this shell. But it's the orbital energy of that electron that gives the atom its size. If the, if the electrons quit orbiting, uh, we would compress a giant star into the size of a singularity. All right, so let's go back to helium. Helium is inert. Helium doesn't inert with, helium does not react with anything uh, because its electrons are in a perfect state. That's what's important here. Its electrons have achieved a perfect state. So the electrons uh, are not interested in moving around. Right? All right, well, here's, hydrogen here's a hydrogen atom. It's the smallest atom, the proton being positively charged in the center. And there's my electron in orbit around it. Problem with hydrogen's electrons, they get lonely and they tend to run away. All right. And so now we're left with just a proton, a positively charged ion. And I'll tell you right now, when we see this proton in water, uh, we'll call that a hydrogen ion. This is what defines an acid right there. And we'll come back to that. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make here is that proton helium can hang on to its electrons with ease. But hydrogen it cannot hang on to its electrons. Its electrons want to run away. And why is that? Something to keep in mind is that electrons that want to run away we put those to work in biologic systems because moving electrons is energy. I used to have a picture of a water wheel here, uh, and I'll try to put that on the YouTube channel, that when the river uh, moves through the wheel, that wheel converts the river flowing into mechanical energy. We see the same thing if you have windmills. We have windmills on this island. The wind blows through the fans, and the fans turn to generate electricity. 
your body does the same thing. Instead of converting wind into energy or converting water into energy, your body converts moving electrons into energy because moving electrons is energy. Well, helium is so stable, it won't react with anything. Helium is inert because its electrons are in a perfect state. So, inert atoms are not used in biologic systems, quite simply because their electrons don't want to move, and it's moving electrons that's the key to energy utilization in living systems. So, helium, why are your electrons so happy? Well, because electrons want to be a pair. Uh, single electrons get lonely and want to run away and find a partner to share its house with. We've heard these stories before. So if hydrogen only has one proton, it can only support one lonely electron. So how can we get hydrogen's electrons to be happy? Well, maybe we can get two hydrogens to share their electrons in a house, and that's what we have here. Notice we have two protons, but they are not in the same nucleus. Uh, they are in separate nuclei. And what we have is a proton atom, and we have two, I'm sorry, we have two hydrogen atoms that are sharing their electrons. And now uh, these electrons seem to be in pairs, and now they're happy. And what have we done? we formed our first molecule, H2, hydrogen gas. Hydrogen gas is called H2 because there are two hydrogen atoms covalently bonded to each other, and they're covalently bonded because of the electrons sharing uh, orbits. Uh, however, uh, H2 is not completely inert. Hydrogen gas is not inert, and we'll talk about that. But what I want you to know is in chemistry and physics, and pharmacology and all sciences, there are a molecule is quite simply a stable group of at least two atoms or more in a definite arrangement held together by strong bonds like covalent bonds. And so a molecule is still the smallest part of a substance that retains the property of that substance. Uh, the hydrogen gas molecule H2 behaves differently than just two separate hydrogen atoms. All right, so be careful as we go through pharmacology. If you go through professional pharmacology books, they will throw around these words right here. Hydrogen ion is the same thing as a proton, and this is the same thing as an acid. A hydrogen atom is a proton and electron. A hydrogen molecule is H2, uh, two hydrogen atoms uh, put together by covalent bonds. Again, the moving electrons is the key to energy utilization. Uh, so inert atoms are not used in biologic systems because biologic systems must be able to move electrons. If you've ever sat, if you've ever been near power lines and hear them buzzing, that buzzing noise is just quite simply the electrons racing through the power lines. Um, and because electricity is quite simply electrons moving through the wires. Hydrogen gas is rare in our atmosphere. It's lightweight, uh, makes it float away. 75% uh, of the weight of the universe is elemental hydrogen. I don't think I ask any of those questions on the exam. But I do want you to know this, that atoms that share electrons are covalently bonded. Uh, a, valent, uh, a valency is a house. And so when we talk about valencies with atoms, uh, those are the houses of electrons, and those houses like to have pairs of electrons. Uh, if you think about a covalent dorm, is a place where male and female uh, live under the same, live in the same dorm. And so that's what covalent means, sharing a house. Uh, well, once atoms are covalently bonded, it's difficult to separate those covalent bonds and usually requires energy to do so. So in pharmacology, when we talk about a covalent change on a receptor, uh, that's usually permanent. That's a, that's a change that's occurred to the receptor. It's going to be irreversible. So that's why we talk about covalent bonds. All right, so we talked a little bit about how hydrogen makes one covalent bond. Let's talk about oxygen. Oxygen can make two covalent bonds. You see where we're going with this. Uh, oxygen atoms have two spare electrons to share. That means they have an empty room for two extra electrons. 
So oxygen will make two covalent bonds. In the case of oxygen gas, both bonds are made with another oxygen, and this is called double bonding. All right, this is not zero equals zero from our Math 18 class. Uh, this is O2, oxygen covalently bonded in a double bond with another oxygen. Uh, that's what that is supposed to be showing you. All right, well, underneath helium, is neon. On the right of your periodic table uh, are the inert elements. Uh, it is the center of my periodic table. It's on, uh, I'm sorry, the right side of yours. And right underneath helium is neon. Now it's the same neon. We take neon signs. If you take neon and put it in a vacuum tube and run electricity through it, it'll glow. Uh, but neon won't react with anything. Uh, because neon has happy houses of electrons and they're all paired up and as happy as can be. And yeah, eight and two. Ten electrons for the ten protons. Good. I knew I added that up. All right, well, oxygen is not like neon. It's two steps away from perfection. That means that there are two houses with single electrons and they want to pair up with other electrons. And how do they go about doing that? Well, this right here, uh, they have covalently bonded with each other to form O2, which is oxygen gas. So when we talk about breathing oxygen for metabolism and respiration, uh, we're breathing in O2, two oxygens uh, that are covalently bonded with each other. All right, oxy oxygen gas is present in the atmosphere at 21%. I want you to know this. This is very important. People think that when they're breathing air, they're breathing pure oxygen. Uh, when somebody's breathing the air, we'll say, oh, let them breathe the oxygen. They are breathing air. Air that we breathe is only 21% oxygen. Uh, we do not want to be in a world where it's 100% oxygen. That wouldn't last very long. It would explode very quickly. And so fortunately, what we breathe is mostly nitrogen and 21% oxygen. Uh, and the way we say 21% oxygen in the uh, healthcare business is this right here. The fraction of inspired O2 is equal to 0 0.21. Uh, in science, and in, uh, in my side of the world, that F, that fraction, uh, doesn't mean a, a numerator with a denominator. Uh, that fraction is just uh, quite simply a number between 0 and 1. And uh, I stands for inspired, and so get used to this nomenclature right here. Uh, don't say FiO2 is equal to 21%. Uh, FiO2 is equal to zero. Notice that leading zero, that is essential in healthcare. Please don't say 0.21, play, say 0 0.21, or at least write uh, 0 0.21. All right, we've belabored that point, but I want you to be familiar with that nomenclature right there. All right, back to our regularly scheduled program. All right, well, we did make a hydrogen uh, molecule, and we made an oxygen molecule, and so we're going to stick them together. This is a classic science experiment. Uh, we'll stick them together in a balloon, and what happens when you put oxygen gas and hydrogen gas together in a balloon? Nothing. Nothing happens at all. But what if we add a little spark? And that's called activation energy. What if we add a little flame, a little spark uh, to get things going? Well, then what would happen? Uh, boom. Uh, this is what happened. Rocket engines burn hydrogen and oxygen gas, and so it's stored in the rocket as a liquid. And when the oxygen and hydrogen liquid are released out the back of the engines, uh, they're mixed together and set on fire, causing an enormous amount of heat and fire and thrust. And what's the result? Water. That's the, that's the byproduct of burning hydrogen gas and oxygen gas water. Uh, so burning hydrogen gas and oxygen gas will result in water. And there's the balanced equation on the bottom. If you have two hydrogen molecules and an oxygen molecule uh, and you add act activation energy, uh, then you will have an exothalmic uh, reaction uh, resulting in two water molecules. I got an email saying, well, what about carbon dioxide? Everything that burns gives off carbon dioxide, and that's not true at all. Carbohydrates that burn uh, give off carbon dioxide. Hydrocarbons that burn uh, give off carbon dioxide because there's carbon in the thing that's being burned. Uh, but hydrogen gas and oxygen gas 
uh, will release enormous amounts of energy and the end result is water. And this is the reaction that occurs very, very slowly and carefully in electron transport. If you know anything about mitochondria and electron transport, uh, once that electron bounces down the stairs, uh, it ends up on that oxygen and results in water. And so I wanted you to see uh, that that step occurs uh, very spontaneously out the back of a rocket, very carefully inside of a biologic creature. All right, so now that we've made some water, let's talk about water. Uh, water molecules are not flat. Uh, the oxygen is covalently bonded at angles. And can you remember why that is? Do you understand why that is? All right, so if you look at our space filling model, again, water is not a flat molecule. Uh, water has oxygen and then hydrogens uh, that are down on one side of the molecule. Again, H2O, that's where that comes from. Everyone knows what H2O is. Do they know it's two hydrogens and an oxygen? And that they're not covalently flat? Uh, co they're not covalently bonded at, at flat angles? All right, so even though the oxygen and hydrogen uh, share electron, they, remember the oxygen still has electrons on top uh, that it did not share. There we go, that's the picture I'm looking for. All right, so here are these happy electrons, and they're not going to bind with anything because they're already paired, but these are electrons looking for a partner, and they find them in hydrogen atoms. All right, so now the hydrogen atoms are covalently bonding with the oxygen, and notice oxygen is making two covalent bonds. Each hydrogen is making one covalent bond, and so we're following the rules. All right, but by adding hydrogens down on this end of the water molecule, uh, these hydrogens, these protons in the nuclei, uh, they make this end of the water molecule more positively charged. This end of the water molecule is more negatively charged, even though the entire molecule itself has a zero charge. Oh, this was very difficult for me to uh, grasp very early in my career. And so uh, if some of the stuff is difficult for you to grasp, that's okay. Uh, you have the rest of your life to figure this stuff out. I promise. Right. Well, that's why we call water polar. Uh, water is a polar solvent. It's more negative on one side of the molecule, more positive on the other side of the molecule. So because of that difference, it's polar. There's polarity. One side's a little bit more negative, one side's a little bit more positive. So because of water's polarity, it attracts other molecules that are polar, and it will attract charged ions. And so sodium chloride will divide into its ions just naturally in water <coughs> because water is polar. But because water is polar, it also repels nonpolar molecules uh, like hydrocarbons, lipids, fats, and oils. Well, because the water is polar, the hydrogen of one, one water molecule is strongly attracted to the oxygen of the other water molecule. That will be denoted <coughs> in double bonds. And so when you look at a book uh, that has double bonding, those are considered hydrogen bonds. They'll be shown with dotted lines. Hydrogen bonding is very important in pharmacology. Hydrogen bonding will not only occur between a hydrogen and an oxygen, uh, but hydrogen bonding will occur uh, between a hydrogen and a tertiary nitrogen uh, with its extra set of electrons as well. And so uh, be on the lookout for hydrogen bonding between a hydrogen and oxygen uh, and hydrogen bonding between a hydrogen and a nitrogen. We'll see that in pharmacology as well. Well, it's that miraculous angle of the water molecule that causes all sorts of interesting things to occur when water freezes. When water freezes, it floats. There's nothing else like that. Everything else that turns to solid sinks. And if water sank to the bottom, uh, if frozen water sank to the bottom of ponds and lakes and oceans, there'd be no life in the universe. Uh, so to make water float, it has to be designed in a very, very, very special way to make all sorts of beautiful things. Uh, it's interesting, the last two cartoons we've watched in my house were, were Frozen and Moana. Uh, maybe we'll talk about that next time. All right, if you get on YouTube uh, and watch the video of the Hindenburg and study that, uh, there's all sorts of interesting conclusions that you can draw, but what I want you to see is at the time those Zeppelins uh, were filled with hydrogen to make it float in the air. 
and a single spark uh, caused it to explode and burn instantaneously. It took less than a minute uh, for the Hindenburg, uh, it took a little over a minute for the Hindenburg uh, to burn completely to the ground. And so what I wanted you to see is that hydrogen gas was released spontaneously and enormously and uh, released all that energy in a spontaneous way. Uh, but in biologic systems, we have to control that burn in a very slow, efficient, and stable manner because biologic systems are masters of efficient, renewable energy use. And uh, these are terms that I hear used uh, every day, efficient renewable energy use. And a great place to look for efficient renewable energy use is how biologic systems have mastered that. All right, so we control hydrogen <coughs> and oxygen burning by using carbon as a backbone, a skeleton for biologic molecules. So as we go through carbohydrates that we use for energy, notice that to release energy from the carbohydrate, we're essentially mixing oxygen and hydrogen in a way that makes not only a water molecule, but a carbon dioxide. And uh, this is something that I want you to see uh, slows down that reaction of combining, car um, combining hydrogen and oxygen. All right, so uh, what's left after the fire dies? All right, well, all that white stuff is phosphate, and we'll talk about that later. But the black stuff is carbon, and so when something burns, that black stuff, well, well that's carbon. The oxygen, hydrogen have been burned off, and we've been left with, uh, with carbon and phosphate, the white stuff. Uh, but the oxygen and hydrogen were not in a gas form. They were in the molecular form uh, bound to carbon. And so we'll call those carbohydrate. Hydrate as in water, meaning that's the end result of the reaction, is taking uh, those hydrogen and oxygen molecules and putting them together to release energy and result in water. And so all of this, all the carbohydrates, the starches, and even cellulose. Cellulose is wood. Uh, it's a carbohydrate. We can't digest it. Some creatures can digest cellulose, but we can't. But sugars and starches are carbohydrates. And they are all made by creatures' biologic systems harnessing the energy of the sun, capturing the energy of the sun, capturing the sun, and making it do what we need to do to have better lives. And I'm pretty sure that's how the story started. And now here we are talking about it again. All right. So biologic systems capture the energy of the sun so that we can utilize uh, the energy uh, for biologic systems. I think I've made that point. Hey, remember these? We were talking about these right here, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. Okay, we talked about how hydrogen makes one covalent bond. We've talked about how oxygen makes two covalent bonds. Let's talk about nitrogen. It's time to talk about nitrogen, isn't it? Oh, we're going to skip and talk about carbon. I guess we talk about nitrogen last. Uh, I hope I have the right slides in front of me. All right, so uh, we're talking about carbon. Carbon is a very unique substance. Uh, pure carbon can be in the form of a black powder like coal or graphite. Uh, pure carbon can be formed into a diamond. And in biologic systems, carbon only makes four covalent bonds. And so here's my carbon uh, with four covalent bonds. Uh, carbon likes to make four covalent bonds like the hydrogen gas methane. And so here, uh, carbon is making four covalent bonds with the hydrogens. Notice each hydrogen is making one covalent bond. And like carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, notice my carbon is making four bonds and each of my oxygens is making two bonds, so we're following the rules. Carbon dioxide uh, is a flat molecule. It will go into water and make an acid, uh, however, uh, Carbon dioxide is the end result of efficient combustion of carbohydrates. So because the carbon is the backbone of biologic molecules, we won't even show it in molecular diagrams. We just assume they're there, and then whenever a bond seems missing, uh, we know that it's attached to a hydrogen. 
All right, so let's find the carbon atoms here. Uh, do you see the carbon atoms here? There they are. So again, when we look at this, every line that we see is a covalent bond between carbons, unless, oh, we bothered to put the oxygen right there. All right, so there's a carbon right here, a carbon right there, a carbon here, and a carbon there, because each of these lines is denoting a covalent bond. All right, so my oxygen is making two covalent bonds, but each carbon is only making two covalent bonds. It should be making four. And so to make sure that each carbon is making four covalent bonds, anything missing in the diagram is a hydrogen. All right, so that's what it'd look like if we spent time making the space-filling model, uh, but nobody has time for that. Uh, if we really drew that figure out, it'd look like this. All right, uh, maybe fill in that oxygen up there. But again, each corner uh, is a carbon. They don't even draw it like that. They'll draw it like this. And so that's why we go through this, because you'll see, uh, you'll see pharmacology. Uh, when you look at package inserts, they'll draw the molecule for you, and uh, they'll draw it just like this. All right? And so I wanted you to see where that comes from. All right, let's talk about oils, lipids, fats, and hydrophobic lipophilic substances. Uh, these substances are repelled by water uh, because carbon evenly distributes its hydrogens around itself, it's not going to be attracted to polar substances like water. So water and oil won't mix. Oil will make a little rainbow on top of the water. So be careful with words. Hydrocarbons are carbons with hydrogens. Carbohydrates are sugars and starches uh, with carbons. Uh, carbohydrates are sugar and starches and they're just quite simply a ring of carbons, and around each carbon is a hydrogen group and a, a hydroxide group ready to combine to release energy and make water. That's why it's called a carbohydrate. So some hydrocarbons, methane, ethane, propane. Yeah, the same propane we have a hard time finding at the stores, this propane right here. This is how they draw propane. Not like that, like this. And again, each line is a covalent bond between carbons. Uh, octane, they tell you about octane at the gas, gas pump, like you know everything about octane. Those are all hydrocarbons. All right. So hydrocarbon chains are nonpolar. That means they repel water, ions, and other polar substances. Uh, molecules that are not charged or polar are lipophilic. They like fatty, oily, waxy, greasy molecules. And so that basically, uh, lipophilic means fat-loving. Hydrophobic means water-repelling. It's the same word. All right. So I want you to know the difference between hydrophilic, hydrophobic, lipophilic, lipophobic, philic meaning to like, phobic meaning to repel, hydro, water, lipo, fat. All right, we'll throw in the saturated hydrocarbons. Uh, saturated hydrocarbons just mean the chain's completely full of hydrogens. And that means there's no double bonds in the carbon chain. That means they, the hydrocarbons will stack perfectly on top of each other and stick together in the side of your arteries. That's why they like to say saturated fats are bad for you. Uh, and they form solids uh, at uh, room temperature for this reason right here, uh, because the saturated hydrocarbons stack nicely against each other. Uh, and so they'll form a solid at lower temperatures. Unsaturated fats, they talk about all the time on TV. It depends on what kind of unsaturated fat it is, but it's called unsaturated because the carbon chain is not completely saturated in hydrogen, which means there's a double bond somewhere. And if there's a double bond, double bond somewhere in the carbon chain, then the, 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 the hydrocarbon takes this hairpin turn and they don't stack together so nicely. And so things that are naturally unsaturated uh, don't stick together so well. Uh, they tend to be liquids at room temperature, and they form solids at uh, even, uh, even lower temperature. All right, let's talk about aromatic rings. Uh, aromatic rings, the carbon shift their double bonds back and forth from carbon to carbon. So there's an aromatic ring right there, and it will be usually drawn with a little circle, and it'll be the little hexagon with a circle in it. It's an aromatic ring, and what it's doing, it's shifting its double bonds back and forth instantaneously. And so here in the picture, uh, no matter how you count, uh, each carbon is making three covalent bonds, and so if we add uh, hydrogens around the side, uh, then you'll notice that each carbon is making four covalent bonds. Uh, aromatic rings are essential in biologic systems. They're very, very stiff, and they hold their shape. And uh, don't confuse the aromatic rings with the um, 
the, the six ring structures of glucose and the other carbohydrates. Our aromatic rings will be drawn like this. All right, they'll either be drawn with the little lines or they'll be drawn with a circle in the center. And we'll see these all the time in molecular diagrams because they're everywhere. Uh, we're going to take tyrosine, an amino acid. Uh, we're going to start with phenylalanine and make tyrosine. And then we're going to take tyrosine and make L-dopa and dopamine and norepinephrine and epinephrine. All right. And it's just quite simply an amino acid. And if we filled in all the carbons, uh, they'd be there. And nobody has time for that. That's, that's why they draw it like this. I'll tell you right now, these carbons are missing. Why is that carbon right there, Dr. Farmer? You said the carbons are not included. Uh, well, this is part of what's called a moiety. This is a functional group. That carbon is part of the acid group. It's not part of the structure. It's part of a functional group. And so when the carbon is actually part of a functional, reactive part of the molecule, they'll draw the carbon. Uh, but they won't draw the rest of the carbons because they're just part of structure. And if you really want to know where they are, well, you can figure it out just like that. Um, but most of us don't really care. Back to our regularly scheduled program. We talked about how hydrogen makes one covalent bond. We talked about how oxygen makes two covalent bonds. Uh, we've talked about how carbon makes four covalent bonds. Uh, there's a set of notes where we cover nitrogen first, but since nitrogen's most complicated, uh, somewhere I thought it would be a good idea to talk about it last. All right, so hydrogen one, oxygen two, uh, nitrogen three or four, and then uh, carbon can make four. All right, so one, two, uh, three, and four. All right, here's a nitrogen atom. It's three steps away from perfection. It's three steps away uh, from being like an inert atom. So it has three houses of single electrons uh, looking for a match. And so one of the ways uh, a nitrogen can find a match is with another nitrogen atom. And so in this case, nitrogen gas. Uh, here, the nitrogen is triple bonded with another nitrogen. And so that's what we're trying to show you. Nitrogen gas, N2. And it makes up 79, 80% of the air that we breathe. Uh, due to rounding air, all that stuff never really adds up to 100. It adds up to like 101. All right, so nitrogen is very unique. Nitrogen is the most common gas in our atmosphere, 79%, 80%. Uh, and the triple bond between the two nitrogens is very, 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 very difficult to separate. It's very strong. And so nitrogen gas is almost inert, not completely inert. It's not like the inert elements. Uh, but separating the nitrogen into biologically useful nitrogen is called fixation. And so when you hear about nitrogen fixation, that's just something that can split the nitrogen gas in half and then turn those nitrogens into biologically useful things like amines and aminos. All right. All right, so when I went to school back in the Fred Flintstone era, uh, lightning is what they told us caused nitrogen fixation. However, in the modern era, we know that it's bacteria in the soil. Soil sciences and agriculture is so essential in pharmacology. And here we're just starting with soil science. It's bacteria in the soil, uh, in the roots of the legumes that are nitrogen fixers. They divide nitrogen gas up so it can be used in biologically useful nitrogen. All right, so nitrogen makes three covalent bonds. However, nitrogen can make a fourth covalent bond, and this confused me for the longest time when I was in chemistry class. Nitrogen makes three covalent bonds, but nitrogen can also make four covalent bonds. All right, when the nitrogen makes the fourth covalent bond, the nitrogen becomes positively charged, and this is very important in pharmacology. When it's making three bonds, we'll call it tertiary. You can write tertiary next to the making three covalent bonds. And then you can say no charge. All right. uh, nitrogen can make a fourth covalent bond. You can write quaternary. Uh, and notice that it makes a positive charge once that nitrogen takes that fourth covalent bond. Well, remember, water is attracted to positively charged things, but water is not attracted to things that are not uh, polar or positively or negatively charged. 
all right? So water is going to be, this is going to be a quaternary nitrogen in general. It's going to be much more water soluble than a tertiary nitrogen. And they talk about this stuff all the time in pharmacology books, like you guys have a PhD in this. And, and that's why we go through this. Instead of pretending uh, like we know what all those mean, uh, we're going to try to actually get a good foundational view of what's going on. So here's my nitrogen atom with three places uh, to attach, uh, three places to make covalent bonds. Uh, and so here's my amino group, uh, NH2. R can mean anything. Uh, R means variable. Uh, it doesn't stand for any element. So R can be a hydrogen sitting right there. R can be anything. All right, so R just means variable. It could be anything. And so this nitrogen, this amino group is attached to something. All right, so there's my two hydrogens that make up the amino group. And this amino group uh, has the two extra electrons. And depending on what's going on with the R group, uh, maybe it's putting pressure on the electrons in this direction that make them happy. Uh, maybe it's pulling on the other direction and making the electrons greedy. And so depending on what's going on with this R group, uh, it determines what goes on with this pair of electrons right there. And sometimes, because of what's going on with the R group, those electrons can get greedy and they'll want to steal a proton or go make a covalent bond with something. And so, well, here's a carboxylic acid over there, and my greedy electrons have just stolen the proton from it. And what has happened? All right, well, now the nitrogen's making the fourth covalent bond by stealing that proton, and by stealing the proton, uh, this amino group is now in NH3 and positively charged, and now our carboxylic acid uh, has, two, uh, has a pair of electrons uh, that they're looking to pull their proton back. Uh, and so that just depends on what's going on in the chemistry of the water. And we'll come back to that. But what we've done is introduce the game of acids and bases. The game of acids and bases is just quite simply the game of moving protons from one molecule to the other. And moving protons and electrons is about energy utilization. So when you talk about acids and bases in your healthcare classes, Oh, they'll talk about uh, metabolic acidosis and respiratory acidosis and metabolic alkalosis and respiratory compensation and renal compensation. And I don't think I've read anything uh, that has been presented uh, to any of you that is accurate in describing metabolic acid acidosis, alkalosis, and respiratory and co kidney compensation and Winters and Naren's formulas and all of that. But what I do want to tell you is what is essential about acid and base function in the body is that maintaining a perfect balance is essential for the chemistry to occur. And so if the pH of the body, if the acid balance base is off by a little bit, these complex chemical reactions cannot occur because moving electrons is the key to energy utilization. Acids and base balance is about energy utilization in your lungs, in your kidneys, uh, and the buffering system in your blood, they all get together to try to keep things perfectly balanced uh, so we can do this right here. Have energy, energy utilization. All right, so this is where the ion word comes from. If we, I don't care about ammonium, uh, but if anything has a net extra proton, then it's going to be positively charged. All right, so this is positively charged because there's one more proton in the molecule than there are electrons. That's why it's positively charged. And so a positively charged atom is called a cation. All right, and you'll hear about cations. Uh, so anything that's negatively charged, that means there's one more electron in this molecule than there are um, protons. And the only way these things can hang out is in the water. All right, so these ions are things we'll find in the water. And anything that's negatively charged is an anion. That's what I want you to see from all of this. Any substance that releases a hydrogen into the water, it will be called an acid. And so when we take a substance and we put it in the water, and one of the results is this hydrogen ion floating loose in the water, that's an acid. Uh, by the way, anything that can take that hydrogen out of the water is a base. And so here's hydroxide. It's an excellent base because when it comes across that proton, it incorporates it 
and makes a water molecule. So again, water was the, is the end result of energy utilization. Not only was water the end result of electron transport, uh, water is the end result of the combination of acids and bases, or at least hydroxides and hydrogens, and, and water is always separating and reconnecting, uh, but that's a different speech. All right. So again, what I want you to see is that water is the end result, and there's water everywhere. Uh, we just need to be able to drink the water uh, that we see. All right, uh, so then there's tyrosine, my amino acid. And we hear about them all the time, like they're some kind of important ingredient in shampoo, and they're, them as an ingredient in the human body is very important. All right, and so this is the generic structure of all amino acids, and we talk about this next time, an amino, as, an amino moiety, an acid moiety, and then a variable group. And we talk about this next time, so I'm going to go ahead and push through this. R means variable, and a moiety just means a functional group of atoms. For, hopefully today will be the last time we use the words moiety in a pharmacology class. All right. The moiety was only, uh, only time I heard the word moiety uh, was in chemistry class in college, and then the only next time I ever heard the word moiety uh, was sitting in this chair coming out of my mouth. All right, when we talk about an amino acid, we'll talk about the alpha carbon, uh, and we'll talk about this next time. But there's an amino group, a carboxylic acid group, an R group, and a hydrogen group. And again, we'll see all this next time. All right. Why, Dr. Farmer, why are you doing this? All right, because when I read pharmacology books, they talk about ions, acids, bases, polar substances, non-polar su non -polar substances, hydrophilic versus lipophilic, hydrophobic versus lipophobic. Uh, they talk about phospholipids. They talk about amino acids. They talk about nucleotides, nucleosides, and nucleic acids. Like, you guys have PhDs in this stuff, and so that's why we're going to just touch on all this stuff really lightly. Uh, so you guys have a good foundation uh, to build your pharmacology knowledge for the rest of your life. Look, when you take other classes, and believe me, I have taken plenty, uh, you kind of learn the information and then hope it goes away. But if you're going to be in the professional healthcare business, uh, pharmacology is in a class that you're going to take this summer. Uh, pharmacology is a discipline that is going to require your discipline for the rest of your career. And so what we want to do with this course is teach you how to build on your pharmacology understanding over the course of your career uh, because a lot of pharmacology is a life and death sport. Uh, unlike a lot of disciplines uh, we study, uh, pharmacology errors uh, do so much more harm than people realize. And there's way too many people on way too many medications. And so if we're going to really do anything about better use of medication, more effective use of medication, more cost-effective use of medication, then we really need to have a foundational understanding of pharmacology. Pharmacology in general is taught to people with a master's degree. Uh, and here, uh, we're going to try to simplify things to get everyone up to speed quickly. All right, so let's talk about some fun stuff before I run out of time. All right, well, the periodic table is actually round, uh, like this four-dimensional sphere thing. Uh, and then they put it like a flat map of a round planet. It doesn't really work out so well. So notice uh, my perfect stuff over here on the right. Uh, that stuff actually belongs in the center. And so if you think about it being round, uh, well then, now I've put my good stuff in the center and on either side are my four basic building blocks of, of biochemistry, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. So uh, there they are. Uh, so we've blown this up. This is where we are on the periodic table. Uh, you're in the right of your table, the center of mine. And notice it starts to count correctly. One, two, three, four. Well, there's five somewhere. Six. And... Uh, one, two, three, four, six. Um, there they are. Mm, anyway, moving forward. So my perfect stuff is in the center, and notice there's my four basic building blocks of perfection. Uh, one step away, uh, two steps away, three steps away, four step away, one covalent bond, two covalent bonds, three covalent bonds if neutrally charged, four covalent bonds. Right. And that's where that comes from. That's where that structure comes from. Uh, right underneath oxygen on the periodic table is sulfur. And the reason it's right underneath uh, um, oxygen on the uh, periodic table is because those outer valencies are 
uh, very similar. Oxygen and sulfur are very similar to each other when it comes to chemical reactions. And we understand this from volcanic life forms uh, that are found here in between Maui and the Big Island. Way underneath the water, down deep, are these volcanic vents and they spew toxic, toxic sulfuric acid at temperatures that are uh, like 600 degrees, uh, but the water doesn't boil and we would think it's impossible for life to thrive down there, but it thrives around these volcanic vents because the bacteria don't have access to oxygen. So they're using sulfur as the end product of their electron transport, and then those bacteria feed all of these creatures down here. And it's our understanding of volcanic life forms that makes us realize the potential for life even in our solar system, very simple life because there is volcanoes and water uh, on the moons around Jupiter and I hope I live long enough for them uh, to see this sorts of thing and they are just starting to look into it. But the volcanic life forms uh, that we discovered right between here and the Big Island are really one of the most important and foundational uh, discoveries uh, in understanding life in the universe, at least in my opinion and, and a few others. All right, well, there's sodium chloride. Uh, notice sodium's on one side of perfection, chloride's on the other side of perfection, and when sodium and chloride are in water, uh, they will divide into their positively charged ion and respective negatively charged ion. But when they come out of the water, uh, then they make sodium chloride, this little white powder uh, in that little box right there. So we're going to take sodium chloride, pour it in the water, make salt water. You guys know what salt water tastes like. Or potassium chloride, one, side of perfe one is one side of perfection, the other is on the other side. So the chloride makes a negative charge, the potassium makes a positive charge. And if we put that into the water, well, we have potassium chloride. And potassium chloride is a salt. I don't know where that salt substitute comes from for salt-free diets. Uh, be sure and ask your health care provider if this is safe for you. Uh, potassium chloride is a salt. Uh, magnesium and calcium are two steps away for perfection. That's why when they're ionized, uh, calcium you'll see is a double charge, two plus. Magnesium, two plus, because they're two steps away on the positive side of the perfection. Where it is? Oh my gosh. Uh, all right, remember nitrogen was our electron juggler. It could switch from three to four. Phosphate. All right, here is phosphorus on the periodic table, and this is what we make phosphate with. All right, so we'll take that phosphorus and put four oxygens on it and make this inorganic phosphate with three negative charges. That's amazing, three negative charges. Uh, that is a very powerful mover of electrons. And so phosphates are essential in energy transfer. Uh, adenosine triphosphate is essential in energy utilization. And the energy conveyor, that energy piece, that energy coin, is just quite simply the phosphate. And because of the kinetic energy, because of the energy involved, anything that's involved in moving phosphates around will be called kinase, as in kinetic, uh, a kinetic enzyme. And we'll talk about that next time. Right. Look at this book. If this lecture is too easy for you, you need to buy these books right here. Basic and Clinical Pharmacology by Katsung. I think there's a newer edition out. It's really thick. When I started teaching this 14 years ago, the book was small and reasonable. Uh, and then I had uh, kept growing over the years. And then someone told me, oh, Katsung and Trevor, a pharmacology examination and board review, full of great questions, all right? And so occasionally I'll get a comment from someone who says, oh, your class is too easy. Oh, your questions are too easy. Uh, I don't see too many people like that, uh, but I know those people don't watch the very ends of the lecture because if you really want more pharmacology knowledge than what I'm giving you, get these books because this course matches these books uh, perfectly. All right, that's enough for this lecture. Uh, the next lecture is 1.2, Cellular Physiology. So until then, aloha.